And I guess that's what we need to, you know, convince people and get people empowered to be ready to, you know, take on what we've got to do. We've got a lot of smart people today. We've got a lot of young people today. And I think, you know, treaty rights is the name of the game. You know, that will stop just about anything out there. You know, white people have asked us to be the buffer zone in many areas, and we've done that. We're going there. So, uh, <clears throat> real interesting, uh, under the Treaty of 1854, there was, uh, of course, we had reservation allotments, and there was a case uh, in uh, Kiwani Bay, Indian community there, you know, versus Michigan, that we have uh, a serious question now on, on how how those allotments were removed and so forth. But in this treaty of 1854, there was a, a, something called half-breed script. Okay, so half-breed breed script, if you, if you were a half-breed or even claimed to be a half-breed, you had more rights than an Indian did because you could pick your, basically, place you wanted to live anywhere in the seated territory. But if you were an Indian, you had to live on a reservation. You had to take a lot of time reservation. Now what this Kiwani Bay case says is that they removed the restrictions on the allotments that were allotted pursuant to treaty illegally. Now the interesting thing is, if you go back and look at this area of the Pinocchi area, there was Indian homesteads out there. If you go way back, you know, so I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on real estate law or any of that, but it's an interesting, it presents an interesting question and I think warrants additional research. We had established most of the reservations um, for the Lake Superior Bands, specifically Red Cliff here, Bad River, Flambeau, um, LCO, Fond du Lac, Grand Portage, a number of the communities, Kiwa Bay. That treaty itself had, had more provisions in it than almost any other treaty that was ever signed with the United States and any other Indi indigenous nation. I've always argued that you could teach all of Indian law based upon the 1854 treaty itself. It's covered everything. And so what does that mean? It, it means that your, your great grandparents, those ones that came before you, thought about everything to what they could do to leave for you. And all aspects, whether it's from taxation to your homeland to your ability to go off the reservation to harvest, whether it's your ability to protect the water, your ability to speak your language, your ability to do all of it. And so that, that treaty, if, if you compare it to any other treaties across the country, none of them compare. And as a treaty lawyer, I've read almost every everyone out there from the Navajos to Fort Laramie to the ones in the Northwest, and I've seen, seen them all, the ratified, the unratified. And by far, the 54, the 42, the 37 are some of the strongest treaties anybody ever signed. And so your relatives thought very hard, and they talk about you know the ceremony that they did, the times that they took out. They said, no, we need some time to come think about this. You know, and they, and they talk about how everybody communicated with each other. They talked about Treaty Three on the north side of, of the lake as it goes from Thunder Bay East and said, I, we understand what you did to our relatives to the south. You're not going to do that to us either. And so together they, they were unified. They were unified as the band and, and they understood because they had engaged in commerce and relationships with the you know, non-Indian public for a long time, 200 plus years. So they knew what they were getting into. So the question is now, as you move forward, you know, what are you going to think about for your great great grandchildren as you go down that line? Because it's our turn today to think about them as those ones before us thought about that. So, what is, it, what is it you're going to preserve for them? Is it true if you don't use your treaty rights, uh, you lose them? Let me give you an example. You guys all remember when the timber litigation was going on. The state of Wisconsin was so scared that they were willing to opt to put parcels of lands out there for people to, to uh, uh, take timber. You know they did that? And the only tribe that I know that went out there and did the timber 
gathered timber out there. It was a small, a small tribe of Bull Lake. They went on for I think almost, almost good up part of the summer. And for whatever reason, I believe the guy from uh, the timber baron from LCO, you know, struck up a uh, movement within the state of Wisconsin and took the tribe's support, and we lost that portion of our right to, to gather. So that's why I tell our people here at every meeting as the Void Task Force Chairman that we gotta start to take a look at taking those fish. Maybe not so much because, you know, we, we were told that we take what we need. But I'm telling you something, if we don't take them, the Department of Natural Resources, some of the state legislators out there, are going to take them from us. They can say if those Indians don't take what they what they declare, no, we're just going to take them. I know that. So I encourage you know your people, if you're spears, netters, or whatever, go out there and take those fish. Make sure if you don't need them, give them to your elders. Give them to the people that need them. Give them to your relatives. Because if we don't do that, if we don't push that issue and protect it, because that's protecting again. We can't, uh, we can't stand up in court. We're arguing right now. So I want to say that much in big You know, we get to share with you, this year was the first year we got with the U.S. Forest Service. We pressured them into, you know, how many people burn wood here because of high gas prices, propane prices or whatever. You know, we've got, uh, I think it's about a thousand cords that like to flamble. I believe any tribe, tribe wants to come up and, and cut wood in that particular area, they've got the right to do that. We reached an agreement with the federal government, U.S. Forest Service, to go in and uh, take that, you know, under you know special agreements that we work out. But we're making headway. And I encourage everybody to do that, you know, near their homelands. You know, if Lambo did it, you guys can do it too. Be rich. There. We don't use the resource, so, you know, we, we have that threat of, of not being able to, to go, out, go ahead and, and use that, take that resource. Um, a little bit about the treaties there that I want to share, that, but KK can give you a better run at it. He's our attorney here. So. So, what the treaties established, because the tribes had those reserved rights clauses in it, was the ability for um, the tribes to say, we, re we expressly reserve the rights to hunt, fish, gather, exercise those inherent rights, those Aboriginal rights that they always possessed. And so, what they did was essentially, in a lot of ways, by granting that land, you know, all the area of the ceded territory to to the federal government saying we will we will let you live here, we will, we will let you use this as well, but in the same avenue the tribes reserved the, the ability to harvest and exercise and have that relationship with the land as they always did. And so really that's where the idea of the 50-50 allocation or the 50-50 split are is that the resource is a shared resource. So nobody essentially has the ability to say, you know, you must ask the tribes first, it is, you know, the tribes have veto authority. But it is because they both have management responsibilities to that resource that it has to be a decision and how that resource is managed um, is up to both sides, both sovereigns. And so even in the court case, because with um, the establishment of the United States as a government, with the, you know, Wisconsin as, a, as the state of Wisconsin and the inherent rights under the state's rights doctrine, they say, well, the state's the ultimate manager of the resource because when they were given statehood, they had um, their ability on an equal footing with all the other original colonies to be the manager because the federal government designates that management authority to each state. But what what the treaties did is it still reserved that inherent right. So even in the court case, they say the state might be the ultimate manager, but that management authority is ex extremely diminished by the ability of the tribes and their right. So so it says that right in, um, it's 
actually the Wally Muskie decision where the judge referred to that. And so that management authority that the state has, the state possesses, is still limited by the ability of the tribes to manage on themselves. And so when we talk about the ability to, you know, can, can those rights be abrogated? Can they be given away? Can they be taken? And, you know, obviously um, the federal government in some ways, because of so-called um, plenary power doctrine, they can do anything they want. But that's not the way it's, it's actually worked out, which is why the government signed treaties, why they implemented, why they have the trust responsibility. So really, as I tried to you know, tell everybody, the only one that can abrogate the treaty is yourself. If you choose not to harvest, if you choose not to go out there, if you choose not to have that relationship, if you choose not to exercise your management authority, if you choose not to enforce your own laws or exercise your regulatory authority, it is only the tribes themselves who can abrogate their truth. And so the courts did say that if you do not harvest your rights, your allocation can be diminished. So it says it can be diminished downward. And so if you don't take the fish you want, if you don't harvest you know, the firewood that you have, then that ability to do so diminishes. And so really it's about the ability to exercise those rights as you exercise your management authority, your regulatory authority, and just the exercise of those rights themselves, you know, really diminishes the state's ability to act without considering what the tribes are going to do. So that's really the hook on how the treaties affect that. The uh, walleye warriors had not uh, based off those anti-treaty rights of protesters. Things would probably be different today. In accord with what uh, Jason just said, in order to retain those rights, we have to get out there and uh, use those uh, resources. <laughs>